She told me all these incredible stories about Scott when they grew up and their their dad, who was a musician and the music they used to listen to. And like all these, just like all these just incredible stories about the family. And, and it made it, it made it real for me. Hi, and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the For Bass Players Only community. A lot of them over 50, and they are learning bass, having the time of their life playing music that they love. You should join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. As I always say, you're never too old to groove, so let's play bass. My guest this week, a very special guest, what can I say about Brian Bromberg? He is an absolute master of the electric bass, the upright bass, piccolo bass. He's played with so many music luminaries in so many seemingly disconnected worlds, (laughs) like jazz legends, George Benson, Dizzy Gillespie, Alvin Jones, Jerry Mulligan, Benny Golson. And then he switches hats and he's played with Whitney Houston, Elvis Costello, Vince Gill, Melissa Manchester, Lalo Schifrin and Joshua Bell, Dean Martin, Donny Osmond, Dudley Moore. There's nothing this guy can't do. He's also released about a thousand solo albums as a leader and a composer. Every one of them is unique. Every one of them is awesome from straight ahead jazz to funky slapping bass to tribute albums to Jimi Hendrix and Antonio Carlos Jobim and so much more. He's got a brand new album out, also a tribute album. This one honors legendary bassist Scott LaFaro. Brand new, released in April of 2024, simply titled LaFaro. And Brian, I'm proud to say, has been a personal friend of mine for, are you ready for this, Brian? 40 years. OMG. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Wow. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> 40 years. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we're still here. Yeah, like 40 years and one month, I think. Do you remember where and how we met? Um, Remind me, and then I'll know I'll remember for sure. I was living in Miami. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, 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 definitely. The good old days. What? The good old days when when there was actually chicken clubs. You can go play. It was great. Great old days. I got together with about 10 friends, and we went to a place called Arthur's Eating House to see Monty Alexander. And I had never heard of you, and you were there with Monty and uh, and Bobby Tom. Not long ago, I hadn't heard of me either. It was incredible. <laughs> and I went up and introduced myself. Who are you? And then we hung out. I remember coming yeah. to the hotel and hanging out with you and Bobby. And it was oh, we became uh, friends. That that I, I just you mentioned this. I'm only going to say this because it was completely not in my mind. But you know who else came down to that gig? Jocko. Because we were there for a week. Jocko came to the gig, and. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know until much later. I hadn't. I didn't meet Jocko. He came in, and and, and the, you know, after after I had met him and we became friends and we hung and all that stuff, he said to me, "He's like, yeah, man, you know, he's like, I, I knew who you were. I, I came and heard you play." And I'm like, "Where?" Like, I started freaking out. You know, I was in my twenties. I was a kid. You know, I'm like, he goes, "Yeah, man, you know, when when you're playing with Monty at, at, at Arthur's, I came in. And I heard a whole set. I just I just sat in the back. Nobody, you, you didn't know I was there." He literally came to Arthur's and 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 was there for an entire set and and never said hello, just hung out in the back. Had I known he was there, I probably would have passed out. So uh, I would have been I would have been a nervous wreck. I I couldn't handle it. Um, but yeah, and then he told me that afterwards, and I was like blown away. So it, it's interesting because that was the same gig that I met you at. So he was there one of the nights we played. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was that actual night. I would have seen him. I would have noticed him. But uh, I didn't get to know him until a little bit. After. That was like right after I moved there, and I didn't get to know him for a year or two later. But yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that was a fun trio, though. It was. Uh, it was. It was. It was cool because I think it was just me, Monty, and Bobby Thomas. Right? It was yeah. just percussion, bass, and drums. So there was no. Yes. Dr- I mean, in piano, there was no drummer. It was really fun. I, it was a lot of fun. I remember it well. Well, uh, congratulations on the new record. I have been listening to it nonstop. It's called La Faro. And I, I just want to ask you, because like I said, you've you've put out uh, more than a few records, including a handful of tribute records. Uh, I, I guess it's an obvious 
this question, why Scott LaFaro? But was there something specific that inspired you to, to make this record? Well, it's it's really interesting because when I think about it now, I did a Jimi Hendrix record, I did the LaFaro record, I did the Joe Beam record, and I did the Jocko record. So I guess I've done four tribute records. That's right. Only one of them was my idea. None of them. Jocko was not my idea. Um, LaFaro was not my idea. And Hendrix was not my idea. The only one that was my idea was the Joe Beam one because it was I did it for J King Records in Japan and they wanted me to do... They wanted me to do a record with an orchestra and I love Brazilian music. So I thought, well, if you want me to do something with an orchestra, man, let me do some, I'll do some beautiful Brazilian stuff with, with strings. It'd be gorgeous, you know? And that's when it was like in the spirit of Joe Beam. That's how that came about. But, um, but even then that, when I think about it, that, that wouldn't have happened if they didn't ask me to do a record with strings. So um, none of those tribute records were my idea. And the, um, since we're talking about the LaFaro, um, it's the same label. It's uh, King Records in Japan. Susumu Morikawa is the, the guy that I deal with there. He's just a sweetheart and we're good friends. And I've been recording with them for many years. And he's he's really challenged me and brought me a lot of records that I never would have done before um, like these, you know, and just some other ones that I that I that I did, um, which has just been great because he's helped me grow as a as a musician and, and as a person for sure. Chal you know, being challenged by really getting into music that I never, ever would have thought I would be doing. So he approached me to do a, a Scott LaFaro record. And I was like, man, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I've done a bunch of tribute records. I just don't know if I should do any more. It's like, you know, I, I, I don't know if I want to touch this one. Scotty was like, you know, no one did what he did in 1959. Are you kidding me? When nobody knew how to set up a bass and there were no pickups and no amps of any, any sort. And this guy's doing all this ridiculous stuff. You know, he was so far ahead of the curve. And it's like, I just don't even know if I want to touch it. Um, so I just said, thank you, you know, but I, I, I don't know. And he's like, no, Brian, please, please consider it because, you know, you know, you can do it. It's like, you know, you you can do this. We, we, we really want you to do this. And I'm like, mm, all right, I'll think about it. But, you know, don't count on it. <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to go there. And then so I started listening to the old Bill Evans records live at the Vanguard and, and listened to Scotty and 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 and. And it just dawned on me at that point how much he really influenced my playing as a soloist. I'm more of a straight ahead walking four on the floor, old school guy, you know, when it comes to like playing jazz. I mean, where Scotty was really, Scotty didn't really play a lot of quarter notes in walking. He was just floating, flying all over the place, doing all this really, you know, um, esoteric artistic stuff, which no one had ever heard of before. Um, but that, that wasn't, that part of his playing wasn't what inspired me. What, ins what inspired me was his soloing and his ability to take risks and to sing and to play in the upper register and just to do all this crazy, crazy stuff that no one had, had nobody did. And then listening to how Bill comped behind him and, and, and what Bill gave him the space to do as a bass player is just, it's just, it's ridiculous. And it just didn't dawn on me until I listened to it 40 years later or whatever, that he really inspired me. And at that point, it's like, I really hear his playing in my playing, even though I don't sound anything like Scott LaFaro, I hear his influence. So I went back to the label in Japan and said, you know what, I'll do it now because, because I really hear how much he affected me as a soloist. And that's when I agreed to do it. And did, did they have a, a concept in mind or did they just say, we want to do a LaFaro record, see what you can come up with? Said they wanted me to do a piano trio record. They did. They, they, we don't care who's on it. It's just piano trio, just knock yourself out, do what you want. The only, the only song they wanted me to do was uh, the solo piece that I did, Danny Boy. He's like, Bill did Danny Boy for Scott after he passed as a tribute to him. So mm -hmm. we'd like you to do Danny Boy solo because Bill Evans did Danny Boy solo. And I, I didn't know that. And so I listened to it and I, <laughs> I listened to Bill's version of it. And it was just like, man, this guy's a genius. He's like, changing keys doing all that just it's it's like it's ridiculous i mean bill uh, bill evans was just insane and i'm like i can't do that it's like i'm a bass player it's like i can't do that you know so um anyway i did my version of danny boy which was playing it and then i you know improvised on it and did it and i'm i'm really really glad i did it it came out it came out really beautifully and um I understand why Bill did it. And for me, it was a rewarding thing to do because A, I never would have thought of doing it. And B, um, it was so much of a, uh, a touching piece for Bill to do dedicated to, to Scott, 
you know, standing board, you know, it's like this. And so there was a lot of emotional calories to it. One thing that I'll just say real quick about this record, Scott LaFaro's sister, who's in her eighties. I met her. Yeah. She, Helene, she, um, she wrote a book on Scott. She did a biography on him and she interviewed me for the book. And, you know, every once in a while in LA, when I'd play an acoustic gig, she'd come to my gigs. And when I knew that I was doing this record, <clears throat> I immediately reached out to her and said, you have to be involved in this. It's like, you have to be involved in this record. I'm doing this for Scott. So we spent a lot of time talking and she came to some of my gigs and um, she told me all these incredible stories about Scott when they grew up and their, their dad, who was a musician and the music they used to listen to. And like all these, just like all these just incredible stories about the family. And, and it made it, it made it real for me. It, I connected to the family. I connected to her. I connected to Scotty through her. And it made me feel like this project was important. It wasn't just another jazz trio record. Who gives a crap? You know, and it's like, um, and, you know, who needs to listen to another record from me? Go listen to Bell Evans. You know, it's like, you know, so it's like it, it, it made it important and it made it real because now I understand Scott a lot more. I understand the family dynamic. I understand the challenges that he was going through at times. And she shared stories with me. That's like, man, it sounds like I'm listening to a carbon copy of myself. Like he's saying the same things that I would say it's like unbelievable. And it just, um, it just gave the project so much more credibility to have her involved. So she wrote a really beautiful piece of liner notes on the, on the actual physical CD and LP and um, it was just really neat to have her uh, part of the process and just made it made it really rewarding for me. That's really beautiful. When, when I met her, uh, there, there was another sister. So I met both of them at the same time. This was at a convention for the International Society of Bassists in mm -hmm. Colorado, I think around uh, 2015. And they were there. There was a story, the bass, I think Barry Colstein had something to do with it. I oh, think he had one of Scott's basses. Yeah, he he got it or gave it or they gave it. Oh, yeah, he's got it. He he reached out to me when he heard that I was doing the record. He was really nice and said, "Man, if you want to play the bass on the record, it's like you know, there's you know, there's no way I could play it. Um, I'm you know, with all my years of my tendon issues and stuff. I mean, I play my basses because they're set up for me because I can't play other instruments because I physically can't do it. Um, there's like no way I could play his bass, but I just thought it was really. A really neat, genuine offer from him of like, man, play his play his bass on the record. I thought that was really sweet of him to offer that, which is which was very good. It meant a lot to me. It was very cool. Yeah, it sounded like you were playing a bass that Scott LaFarra would not have played. It sounded like very low action, and you know, it's gosh, the production is just beautiful. It's exquisite. what my bass, you mean? Yes. Well, it's it's not my my action's actually my action is actually higher than you think it is, but it's low compared to everybody else you know. Um, I, it's it's you can't. If your action is too low, you can't get a sound, you know, so, it's a bell. Um, so, you know, if you want a sound, you have to have some resistance. If there's no resistance, there is no sound. Right. Yeah. So, yes, considering how most jazz bass players play, um, yeah. I'm sure my action is lower than most because it was either that or quit playing bass. Yeah. The doctor said, if you keep playing, you will never be able to play again or we're going to have to go in and shave all the mineral deposits off your tendons and your arms and and you're going to have to relearn and start over. It's like, no way in hell are you touching me, you know, because I did so much damage to myself. And um, I had to relearn how to play and I had to change my setup. And and that's why my action is the way it is. It's, it was either that or quit. And I'm not going to quit. So I, you know, it took me years. You know, I've had several bases in my life, but my Italian base, which I'm looking at behind, the, behind you there, <laughs> um, um, you know, I've had that bass since I was 16 and I wasn't good enough to even play it until I was probably 18 years old. It took, took, took me years of having that instrument to get good enough to even get a sound out of it and play it. That instrument taught me how to play. That instrument taught me how to get a sound. So I learned how to get a sound from that bass. And, you know, I have a very, you know, again, most guys play with higher action than me, but I have enough resistance in my action to get a sound. When you listen to the sound on the record, there's no DI, there's no pickup. It's two mics. That's it. <laughs> what do you think Scott LaFaro would have thought of your two-handed tapping on the upright bass? I mean, who does that? 
<laughs> I think judging by how incredibly creative he was and all the stuff that he did, I think he would have loved it because yeah. <laughs> because I do three and four note chords and I do all this weird crap, you know, um, I think he would have loved it because he was an inventive guy. I mean, he, he did things no one had ever thought of before. And, and I just, I, I really want to be clear to people about where my two handed technique came from. I'm a drummer, right? I grew up playing drums. That's my first instrument. I played drums on my full circle record. I'm the drummer on that record. You know, it's like, I, you know, I'm a drummer. I think like a drummer, I'm a drummer. Well, drummers do this. And so when I started playing bass, I started doing this. It just naturally came out of doing this on my instrument and playing rhythm and playing groove. So that's how that came about. And then it was like, wow, so I can play a chord or I can I can play a groove and I can do different things. You know, I, I could I could make it musical, not just a bunch of noise. I could actually do things with it and say something, not just like, you know, beat up my bass, you know. But it all came about from right, left hand independence, from playing drums to the bass. And then, you know, I don't know if you remember, because you said it was 40 years ago, but all that stuff that I was doing with Monty, hitting the bass and all the groove and all this physical percussion stuff, that all came from being a drummer. And because I did a lot of gigs without drums, like playing with just a piano player or a percussionist and things like that, I became the rhythm section. I would do the percussion stuff and the bass stuff. I used to play with Kenny Rankin a lot, the great singer, you mm -hmm. know, and it was just me and Kenny. I was the percussionist and the bass player. You know, so it was really cool. So so I could use that aspect of my playing musically as well as playing the notes and the changes and doing the job of the bass. I could groove at the same time. So that it all came from being a drummer. It all came from being a drummer. That's where it came from. But I think Scotty would have dug it because he did all this crazy stuff that no one had done before. So drummers don't have to worry about intonation on the bass. Yours is just flawless. It's just beautiful. Oh, thank you. You know who taught me that? A violinist. Somebody you might have known or heard of. His name is Itzhak Perlman. I've when heard I was, of him. When I was 16 years old, I sat 15 feet in front of him watching him play Paganini with an orchestra when I was at the Aspen Music Festival. And I'm watching this guy, and he's playing like the hardest repertoire in the world. Just, you know, it's Paganini. I mean, come on, it's ridiculous, right? And his fingers are like the size of kielbasa sausages, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he's playing an instrument with a string length of a hairbrush, right? So, you know, you think about it on a bass, like here's my index finger, here's my fourth finger, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm playing down, like down at the bottom, right? I'm playing a low F on the E string. That's a G. That's a whole step. Right. <laughs> it's a whole step, right? So if you do this, you can't hear a change in the pitch. <laughs> on a violin with a string length of this up high, you do this, you just went up a third, Right. So the fact that he played, I will never forget this. I, 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 I will never forget this as long as I live. He changed my life. I just was staring at him and studying him and listening to him and watching him. And all I could think of in that entire performance, besides the fact that he was just ridiculous, playing the hardest repertoire in the world with a smile on his face, that yeah. like, blew. but he was in tune. And I just said, how is that possible? It's like, there isn't a bass player in this world that has any excuse to play out of tune after seeing this guy play a violin in tune up that high. This, there's no bass player has an excuse to play out of tune, period. Yeah. You know? So he inspired me and, and, and changed my concept of what intonation is. And um, he, he made me own intonation because if he could own it on an instrument that small, I do not have an excuse. And he changed my life. And that was been my that's been my focus ever since is is to play in tune because if you're playing with a piano player, he can't change his pitch. Right. Right? It's up to me to adjust. Those who adapt survive, right? If you don't learn how to adapt, then you're the problem. And not mentioning names, not saying anything. A lot of incredibly well-known classic bass players, legendary bass players, a lot of great bass players in the world that play out of tune and and somehow they feel it's okay and they can get away with it. You know, it, it's not. You know, A440 is A440. It's not A445 or A435. It's A440, right? It's math. You're either in tune or you're not. It's beautifully binary. It's either in or out. That's it. When you play out of tune, 
it is your responsibility as a bass player, and whether you're playing on the upright or a fretless electric, you play the note, you immediately hear it against a piano that cannot change its pitch. And you know, ooh, I'm flat, I'm sharp. It's up to you to move your finger instantly to correct your pitch. So many of these guys just go bing, and they don't move their finger and they don't change the pitch when it is blatantly obvious they're out of tune. Just adjust. They don't. I don't understand it. Mm. So yes, I'm a stickler for intonation and I work really hard at it. And I have a very, very bastard case of perfect pitch. I don't have good perfect pitch. I'm like, if perfect pitch is from one to 10, I'm like at one half. <laughs> but my pitch is good enough to know when it's in tune or out of tune. And if I hear somebody play an F sharp, I can say that's an F sharp. You know, um, if I hear something on TV, I can tell you what key it's in, you know. But I'm not like some of these guys that are like, you know, you play 10 notes on a piano and they'll tell you what every note is. I can't do that. That's that's crazy. I've seen them do it. It's just it's unbelievable. But um, but yes, you have no you have no excuse to play out of tune. All so, right. That's it. Thank that's you. It. That's on you. Not you, but that's on the that's on the bass player. You know what I mean? If the bass is out of tune, the whole band's out of tune. Well, that's the beautiful thing about the bass, and 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 that's probably. And I know I'm going off in a bunch of different directions, but it's it's cool. You know, the beautiful thing about the bass is that the bass truly is the foundation of a rhythm section. It's not the drummer, because the bass is the rhythmic foundation and the harmonic foundation simultaneously. It's the only instrument in the band or any music that does that. So if I play a note a half step off or something else, you know, if, if the chord is a G major seven and I play an F, it's over, <laughs> right? But if the drummer screws up and, and misses a beat or something, it's no big deal, you move on. If I play the wrong note, everybody's wrong, right? So yeah. it's like, it's, it's really important that, that bass players understand and own and get that you are the rhythmic foundation of the music and the harmonic foundation of the music, both equally. What about, uh, what, I have some more LaFaro questions. You mentioned yeah. Danny Boy. How did you choose the rest of the tunes? I think most everything, and I could be wrong just because, you know, I don't get too deep into stuff, but I think most everything are songs that Bill recorded with Scott. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think everything on the record is something that they did together or pretty darn close. If not, Bill certainly recorded it. Um, and a lot of these songs were just songs that I loved growing up and songs that I used to play at jam sessions and songs that everybody knows. And um, I just thought, you know, I just thought they'd be great songs for the record. You know, there's, there's, we did, we recorded 14 songs in two days. We did it live. We did, you know, one, two or three takes of each song and that's it. There were no overdubs. I made one punch because I completely missed something and had to punch in the note. I didn't make any punches on any of the solos. I just did, we did three takes. I did three solos. That was it. Um, we, um, uh, it was just, you know, I just wanted to do songs that everybody knows that everybody likes that we could have fun. Um, I only changed a couple things arrangement wise, not much, just little things like I did Waltz for Debbie, but I did it as a bossa nova, which yeah. came, out, came out beautiful. That's what I was going to ask you, it's yeah. been a long time since I was in music school, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, uh Waltz is generally played in three, four times. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I'm was, I said, what is that? It kind of sounds like Waltz for Debbie. Yeah. Oh, that's it, 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 <laughs> Because, you know, sometimes you just, you know, I wanted to, it's important to, if I'm going to do a project, whatever it is, especially if it's a project that is associated with someone else, um, I need to make sure it's mine, that it sounds like me, whatever me is. I don't know what me is, but I don't need to do it like I don't need to do a Jimi Hendrix record and try to play Jimi Hendrix licks. Just yeah. listen to Jimi Hendrix. I need to make it my version of those songs and my interpretation. It's it's I'm not going to cop. I didn't learn I didn't learn one Jimi Hendrix lick on any of that stuff. It's like I'm just doing these are great tunes. These are fun. I'm just going to slam and have a great time. That's I'm really it. glad you you mentioned that because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you. I'm thinking I'm listening to this and I said it sounds like Brian Bromberg. It doesn't sound like Brian Bromberg trying to play like Scott LaFaro. It sounds okay. like Brian a Bromberg. that could never happen. B you know, Scott already did it. You don't meet. You don't need me trying to do it. And see, you know, without sounding like a, you know, a complete pain in the butt, it's a Brian Bromberg record. It should sound like Brian Bromberg. Like if, if I'm trying to sound like Scott LaFaro, then listen to a Scott LaFaro record. You know, it's like it, 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 it's it's my honoring 
him and his influence of me. It isn't me trying to play like him or to play the way he did or to learn his licks or his style or anything like that. It's not about that. It's me, it's me honoring his contribution to the instrument and to the music. It's not me trying to play like him because I could never play like him. So why even try, you know? I don't know who I play like, but I need to play like me, whatever that is. And it's my record. I want it to be me and my interpretation or my, um, I don't want to say interpretation because I didn't interpret anything that way. It's just my, just me wanting to play these songs and what they mean to me because of what his influence meant to me. But I didn't listen to, and, and I, I mean this like sincerely, I didn't listen to anything of like, how did he do that? What did he do? Let me try to, I didn't do any of that. I honestly didn't listen to any of that. I, I just listened to the music and and listen to the trio and listen to the interplay. And that's, it's, you know, the one thing that this record does not do, which in a way I kind of, in, in a, this is a double-edged sword when I say this. I think the one thing that I could have done more and we could have done more conceptually as a trio is we could have been freer, right? It's very traditional straight ahead jazz trio we could have been freer in our approach, but then would it have been as honest? Then you're going into something with a concept in mind of like, okay, let's do this. I didn't want to do that. It's like, here's the tunes, let's just play. And that's what I wanted to do. And I think what's captured on this record that I'm really proud of, and you know, I could have hired any drummer in the world, I could have hired any piano player in the world, um, and I could have hired another bass player too, um, but it's like, um, yeah, some people think I should have, but that's a different story. Um, but what Tom Zink on piano and Charles Ruggiero did on drums is they brought an amazing amount of musicianship and listening and respect for the music and tenderness for the music. And it's got balls when it needs to have balls, if I can say that. And it's mellow when it needs to be mellow. And this record of, of if I think back about my career, you know, I've made, a, you know, I'm, we're all young and stupid. We all do stuff. We don't know what we're doing. I've recorded a lot of stuff in my life that was a whole lot of wasted notes that I wish I would have known better. But I was young. I didn't know better. Now I know how to be different. You learn. Um, there's no wasted notes on this record. I know a lot of bass players, they just go, you know, or a lot of sax players, they just, you know, they, 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 it, it's great. But, and there's a place for that. I have a career because of that. And it's also really easy to overdo that and do it too much and rely on what you can do versus jumping into what you can't do or trying to be something better or more mature and different. And I think the one thing about this record, especially with this trio, and we're doing a bunch of gigs as this trio because the chemistry the chemistry is incredible, man. It, it really is. And we play great together. It's because we listen and it's sensitive and it's really right for the music. And that to me is, is what I'm probably the most proud of the most is because it really sounds, I mean, it's really, it's real. You can't, it's, it's undeniable. And, and, and the only thing that I ask people to do when they listen to it, which sadly I've said many times with some of my records is please listen to it and accept it and enjoy it for what it is versus judging it or criticizing it or whatever for what it's not, right? Because if you just listen to it for what it is, it's a really pleasing, really nice, non-threatening jazz record to listen to. And, and I'm not trying to put it down by saying it's a really easy to listen to jazz, real jazz record, but it is a really easy to listen to real jazz record. It is a real honest to goodness improvised jazz trio record, but it's not threatening. It's not intense and it's not like crazy and all this stuff that's exhausting at times. Um, it's, it, it's just it's just nice to listen to, right? And that to me, I'm really proud of the way that came out. I'm glad you mentioned the guys, Tom Zink and Charles R Ruggiero. Is that how you yeah. say it? Uh, I'm not really familiar with either of those guys. And I, I think it's just the three of you just played so beautifully together, both to both choices were excellent. Well, check it, check. This is, this is a funny story. And this, this shows you life, right? You know, we, it's really important 
part of growth as a person and as a musician is to be open, right? And to come into situations with any experience or, or people with, with, a, with a clean slate and just like be open. Again, kind of back to what I said a few minutes ago. Look at it for what it is, for what it's not. Okay, now Tom Zink, the piano player, he and I've been playing together for 30 years. I mean, he's on a bunch of my records doing the contemporary stuff and, and he's been in my band for a very long time. He's a sweetheart. He's great. He's a, he's a great musician. He, he, he's, he, he's, he also does, he's amazing at video. All my videos, he, he does like 90% of my videos. He's like, he's, he's, he, does, he does tons of videos and, and recording for Yamaha. He's like a major dude. He's like really, um, he's just very diverse and very well versed in many different things. But he was also a huge Bill Evans fan. And he's a real jazz piano player and just never gets a chance to play jazz piano. But that's his first love. He's like a huge Bill Evans fan. So when this record came out, it's like, man, you know, Tom's the right guy because every note, his heart and soul is going to be in it. It's not just going to be another date. And sometimes when you work with famous people or, or you know, monsters or this or that or whatever, they're just like, yeah, what's for lunch? What's for dinner? What time can I get out of here to beat traffic or whatever it is? You know what I mean? But with Tom, it's like every note is heart and soul is in it. And that's what I wanted. And, and, and with Charles, the drummer, I didn't know Charles until last year when there's a great sax player in L.A., a guy named Doug Webb. And, oh, yeah. and Doug and I've been playing. Together. I met him through you at the yeah, bank in, my band in like 19. Yeah. And Doug, he's a monster player. He's, he's a great, he's a great jazz player, truly a great jazz player. And, you know, he'll call me for gigs and a lot of times I can't make them, but when I'm available to do a gig with him, even if it's a, a, a local gig that pays nothing and it's just to play and have fun, I don't care. I want to go out and play. Have, I want to go play music and have a good time, play my bass. He's like, man, come do this gig with me. It's not far from where you are. It's like, all right, cool. Who's in the band? Um, Charles Ruggiero. I said, who's that? He goes, the drummer. Who else is on the gig? That's it. Bass, drums, and sax. It's like, we're just going to play tunes. I'm like, all right, sounds fun to me. So I had no idea. I didn't know anything about Charles. He said, Charles is great. You're going to love him. Trust me. He's like, you're going to love him. He's great. So I get to the gig, meet him, really nice cat. And we play. And I'd never met the guy. I'd, I'd never heard of him. I didn't know anything about him. And by, oh, I don't know, bar four of the first song, it's like, he's the guy. I mean, his feel, you know, he's, he, he, you know, his New York background, my New York background, even though I, I grew up in the West, I still lived in New York a lot. My dad was a drummer from New York. My family is from New York. You know, I'm more of a New York guy than a California guy when it comes to music in that way. Charles instant, instantly, like one was in the same place, right? We just, it just felt good. Like his stick and my finger on the string hit at the same time in the same place. And it's like, oh, New York, <laughs> there it is. I literally, I'm not, and I'm not exaggerating. By the fourth bar, I knew that, all right, this is great. This is the cat. And we literally got together. We, we did one rehearsal. We did one gig as that trio. And then we did the record. And that was it. So we really hadn't played together at all. And now we're doing gigs together. And he's just, you know, there's, um, if you go online, there's there's several videos that I've posted. I don't know if you've seen them or not of the, of the trio playing, and there's a bunch more videos coming out. And you know, you check out Charles. I mean, he's so musical, and and he listens. You know, he plays with dynamics. He plays brushes beautifully. It's like like all the things you want in a traditional sounding drummer in a trio situation. It's like he's doing everything exactly the way you'd want it to be. Swinging, hitting hard when he needs to, playing sensitive. He can really comp a bass solo. So many guys I've run into, you know, piano players and drummers, not paying to be judgmental here, but when they play with bass players that play like me and other guys that bass players that have facility and can do stupid shit, if you'll excuse me, sorry, you can edit that out if you have to. Um, they don't know how to comp behind a bass player who can play that way. So they end up overplaying because they're freaking out that they're going to get lost. They don't know what to do. So the, the panel player just be constantly playing and not leave you any space. Or the drummer will just be like, it's like, guys, just, I'm just playing. The change is just back. It's all, you know, give me some space. Sometimes they'll just drop out completely. Well, and if they drop out completely, if the panel player drops out, that's fine. It's when the drummer drops out, everybody drops out. It's like, great. What am I going to do? Go get a sandwich or something like that? It's like, come on, man. You know, I thought we were supposed to be playing together. Isn't that what <laughs> To play together right um anyway long story short um they're great they listen tom and, and and charles and it's really a pleasure to play with them and um i'm really honored to have them on the record i think they did an exceptional job well like i said great choices both of them yeah. 
Well, you, you're telling some great stories here. And in those stories, you've, you've said a lot of very uh, uh, useful and practical things for musicianship and for somebody who wants to play music. I want to ask you about uh, people who want to learn to play bass. And I, I don't mean your 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 twenty year old who wants to have a career in music or or you know travel around the world playing sold out arenas to adoring fans. <laughs> I'm talking about the people that come to. You mean two of them? Yeah, right. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> for bass players only, most of the people that I ended up attracting, not I expected the other the other group to tell you the truth, but I seem to be attracting. Mostly men. We've got a fair bit of women now, too, but men and women in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I've got students in their 80s, <laughs> and they're not looking to make a career out of music. They want to get together and play some classic rock riffs with their buddies. They want to play some blues shuffles, maybe some walking bass, a little punk R&B. And they have some time now that maybe they didn't have before. They've dabbled. They love classic rock from the 70s. They love blues, maybe from the 60s, too. And one of the things that happens, or some of the things that happen when you get to be that age group, arthritis, tendonitis. Uh, some some of my students are recovering from shoulder surgery or uh, you know things like that that, that make it a little more challenging to play the bass. A lot of people think you need to be Brian Bromberg or Stu Ham or Billy Sheehan. I said, no, you, you'd be amazed how great you can make the music feel by laying down a super simple bass line. But I, I'm telling you all this just to give you a context because I want to ask you what advice you can impart to somebody like that who wants to learn to play bass. Well, I mean, you know, th there's many things to your question, and and it's great because it's really important. You know, first of all, um, <laughs> nobody hires me to play a whole bunch of notes unless somebody's wants well, my band to go play a festival. But they're not hiring me because I play a bunch of notes. It's because they like the music, or I had hits on the radio, or whatever it is. They're not hiring me to get you know stand out there and do bass solos for for an hour, you know for ninety minutes. You know, some yes, but not you know most of the time. It's like they it's it's the music, it's the vibe, it's the band, it's the tunes, it's everything, right? So, you know, when I going back to what you said, you know, I look at my resume and it's like, man, I must be incredibly old. <laughs> you know, I've been very fortunate in my life to have played with a lot of great people, but 99 out of 100 of those people didn't hire me because I go, Frrr. they hire me because I have good time. I can read a chart. I can play in tune. I can play what's right for the music, whatever the, the style is, right? It's like you adapt. They're hiring me to do the function and the job of what the instrument is in the music. They're hiring me to play, hiring me to play bass for the role of what the bass is in the music. They're not hiring me to be a soloist. They're hiring me to do the job of a bass player. Well, I'm a bass player. I love playing bass. I love playing groove. Even though I like to solo, that doesn't mean I want to solo more than I want to groove. I like doing both. But grooving and locking with the rhythm section, that's my world. That's the instrument I play. Guys that only play solo bass are never going to earn a living. It's playing in the rhythm section, supporting the music, Look at Lee Sklar. Look at all these guys that like just just play Nathan East. You know, these guys that just play really great, solid parts. And everybody wants them because they do an incredible job from note one. They do exactly what the music says. You know, Neil Steubenhaus. There's a reason why these guys are on thousands of records. They do exactly what you're supposed to do for the music. That's not to be out there and be Eddie Van Halen. May he rest in peace, you know? It's to actually play the bass. We all play bass because we like to play the bass. So that's that's number one. Nobody hires you to go, that's never going to happen. Number two is, you know, you, 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 there, there's a few different ways to look at what you said about so many of your people are now between 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, you know, in that part of life. There's several reasons why. One is because, you know, maybe they're, retired or maybe they had a career and they have more or maybe they they you know they they do well and they have more expendable income they could buy instruments they can buy gear they can have fun whatever it is it doesn't matter they have the time now or they're willing to make the commitment for something that they enjoy but that's the caveat that's the bottom line right there not the caveat that's that's the, the most important thing it's what they enjoy you play music because you love playing music 
you play the bass because you love playing the bass. Whether you have a career at it or you get together with your friends and have a barbecue and jam, what difference does it make? You're having fun playing music with people that you want to hang out with and have the time of your life. That's why you do it. That's it. You play because you love playing. And when it comes to guys like me, or I shouldn't say like me, but guys that have made a career out of it and have focused hard on it, you know, I spent a third of my life practicing five to eight hours a day. You know, well, you don't do that because you think you're going to get rich. You don't do that because you think you're going to meet some hot girls. And you don't do that because you think you're going to be famous. You do that because you love the instrument. You love the music so much that you've dedicated your life to something that you love more than anything in the world. And you're willing to put in the honest time to take your playing to that level. You cannot fake it. And that is the beautiful thing. And I don't care about AI and technology and pro tools and all this crap. It's great. There's a place for everything. But what will never, ever, ever be replaced is the fact of a human being playing an instrument. Right? It's all on you. How good do you want to be? It's up to you how deep into it you want to get your choice. You playing that instrument, it's your relationship with the instrument and the music. And, and that's it. Technology is not going to make you a better bass player. You know, technology can fix mistakes on records, but it's not going to make you a better musician. It's not going to make you a better player on stage. The minute you get on that stage and you're playing with a band, it's all on you, babe. You know, do you groove? Do you have a good sense of time? Do you play in tune? Can you read a chart when somebody puts a chart in front of you? Can you do you know the changes? Do you know where the notes are on your instrument? That is all on the player. You don't go there and get there unless it's something that you want and love in your life. That's the only reason why you do it. So these people that are coming to you at this stage of life, it's a beautiful thing because they're doing it for the right reason. I want to have fun. I really want to play in this rock band. I really want to play in this cover band. I really want to play in this blues band. Who cares what it is? Music's music. I want to have fun. I want to be good at it. I want to be better. I want to have a great time. What a perfect escape from my regular life. I'm an attorney. I'm working all day. Man, I want to come home, have a beer and roof. Man, what's better than that, right? So I think as long as people get and understand that you play music and you play the bass because you love playing music and you love playing the bass. At that point, it's on you. How hard are you willing to work? How much better do you want to be? What kind of facility do you want to have? What do you, you know, you know, what are your goals? You don't have to be a soloist to have a great time playing. You know, you can just groove and and get into the pocket with the drummer and the band and play classic tunes or whatever and have a blast that's no less fun than anything else. It's all the same thing. It's all having a great time doing what you want to do. And that's why any of us should be doing it. We do it because we love it. That's why we do it. It doesn't mean that we don't have to learn how to be good at it. It just means that that we do it because we love it. And that to me is 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 the best part. So I, I think it's awesome that these people are coming to you and, and, and they're at the stage in their life where they're like, I just want to have a great time, man. Bingo. That's why we do it. <laughs> That's why I did it. I just wanted to play music. I didn't think of anything else. I didn't even think I'd ever play on a record, let alone have a recording contract for 30 years. I never thought about it. It's like, I just wanted to play bass. I, I didn't, it just, it, none of it was in the realm of my possibility. All I wanted to do was just be a good player. I didn't even think about success. All I wanted to do was play. But that's why I worked hard and dedicated myself to learning my instrument, hopefully to a point that makes me hireable so I can earn a living doing it, if that makes sense. I think everything you said makes a ton of sense. I just I love every word that you said. And, and I try to impress a lot of those concepts on people, but the, the ones that come to me already get it. You know who I really hope is watching this? It's those YouTuber people <laughs> that they're doing. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's very impressive. That really is. But that's like you said, that's not what people want in a bass player. They want somebody to play the bass. Your I mean, you watch some of these these guys and gals. They're they're like they're ridiculous. It's like they they, they do stuff. I mean, it's ridiculous, but. You know, in one aspect, it's just like, wow, that's amazing. And then I, I kind of want to go to them. That's really incredible. Okay, can you do it a half step higher? <laughs> yeah. All right. It's like, okay, how about you do it about here? All right, let's play Satin Doll. Yep. Right? So, and it's like, you know, and then and you see these, and, and it's it's amazing what they're doing. And, and I, I think it's phenomenal, actually. But name me one situation 
where I don't care if it's a bass player or a guitar player, what it doesn't matter what it is, who is going to hire them on a gig if that's all they can do? Can you play, you know, can you play a Beatles tune? <laughs> you know, can you play a Zeppelin tune? You know, can you play a Charlie Parker tune? It, it doesn't matter. Can you can you play music? See, there's a huge difference between playing music and playing an instrument. Those are two completely different things. And a lot of times they don't they don't work together. You, music, playing an instrument doesn't mean you're playing music. It means you're playing an instrument. Are you making music? Are you well, it's still it's still music. I wouldn't say the, those YouTubers are not making music. I'm just saying it doesn't seem very practical for all the reasons that you just outlined. Well, I, I guess what I mean by that, and I'm not trying to put them down. I guess what I, what I guess what because what, what they're doing is amazing. I'm just saying is that I try to look at things from a common sense point of view and, and the point of view of like, OK, I want to earn a living. I don't need to be rich. I don't care. I just want to earn a living doing what I do. Who's going to hire me to do this? And if you're not thinking about that because you're in the safety of your parents' house or you're in the safety of your little place or your apartment or whatever, and you can do all this crazy stuff, that's phenomenal. But where is it going to go from there? Are you able to take it? I'm not saying they can't do it. No, I get it. I you get got the, it. If you got the talent to do that, then you got the talent to 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 learn to be hireable. You know, I mean, if you, so, I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying you got a choice to make. Take all this ability, right, and now turn that into flexibility, and all of a sudden you become desirable because not only can you play whatever the music is that's needed, you can get out there and shred and blow people's mind. Now you've got two different things happening at the same time. That's a choice. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not trying yeah. to put them down. I'm just trying to say, you've got a choice. Which choice are you going to make? Yeah, no, I get it totally. I was just uh, the only thing that I didn't totally agree with was when you you hinted that it wasn't music. There's music and there's that. But I, I think I used, I used the wrong explanation for it. Is Yes, it is music, but it's one dimensional music. There you go. You talk about being desirable, but first you have to desire to do that. And some do, and I'm sure some don't. But, you know, a lot of people make a lot of money being YouTubers also. So hey, look, if they're if, happy, hey, that's great. If it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? If it, you know, I, I just, you know, that's, I don't think that way because I don't think that way because for me, it was about the music and playing with other musicians uh -huh. and having that brotherhood and sisterhood of, of of the of that spontaneous creativity with other musicians i didn't think of it as like wow i can just sit here and do this and make money I, that just wasn't even in the realm of possibility but hey if it works god bless it yeah. all right i think we covered that one pretty well uh, you've got such an incredible catalog you've got such an incredible uh, uh resume and history what else would you like to do that you haven't already done? What do you, uh, is, is there a project that you've always wanted to do that you haven't done yet? Or is there something else that, uh, that you're working on for the future? I mean, what, uh, you, you're still young. You got a lot of notes left in you. What, uh, what, what's coming up next for Brian Bromberg? Well, in, 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 if I had it my way, I'd own an NHRA top fuel team and that would be my, that would be my world. Um, and and that that would that would be great. Although I wouldn't drive, but I would I would I would certainly like to own a team. Um, what's well? There's it, it's you know <laughs> the beauty of music and the beauty of jazz is that there's lots of styles of jazz and there's lots of styles of music. And in jazz, because that's basically what I've um, uh, you know dedicated my life to, there's two kind of main fo focuses of music, like smooth jazz, contemporary jazz, call it what you wish you know, and traditional jazz, acoustic jazz, you know, that kind of thing. And, and with within those two genres, there's many genres, fusion, you know, world music, all, all these different things, but there's, there's two completely different things. And the one thing that evolved in my career, certainly not even thinking about it because I didn't, it, it just, it just wasn't on my radar. Um, but, you know, growing up, I was a, an acoustic based purist and I was, a, you know, it, it was like, straight ahead or classical music. I, 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 I didn't listen to any electric music growing up. Um, I just, I just didn't, I just couldn't relate to it. I truly liked acoustic music as, as I matured and grew up more realized and, and Jocko was a big reason. Jocko actually was the guy that made me take electric bass and electric music seriously, because it's like, Holy crap, you can actually be an artist and, 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 and play an oar that's got strings on it. You know, it's like, I just, I just didn't get it when I was young, but, um, 
but he he actually was was the guy that that got me to listen to electric music and appreciate it in a completely different way. Well, since then, obviously, my my life has changed. Um, so I love the balance of being able to do the contemporary jazz. Some people call it smooth jazz. It's a radio format, which is the kiss of death. I think it's 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 it has nothing to do with the music, but I, I'll call it contemporary jazz. And then and the straight ahead acoustic jazz. So one of the projects is a new band that I'm part of that's coming out. We're working on the record now. It should hopefully be, be done in the next uh, two weeks to a month. Uh, there's a guitarist who is a, um, he's probably the most successful producer in smooth jazz. They call it in smooth jazz. His name is Paul Brown. And he's produced like all of the major stars in, in, in the format. But, you know, like the Boney Jameses and guys that have sold, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of records. He's got many Grammy nominations, many Grammy wins and things like that. So he's more he's been more behind the scenes, but he's also a guitar player. And he's a really he's a really good bluesy, soulful kind of guitar player. Well, he and myself and a, a sax player, a guy named Michael Paolo, who is um, from Hawaii, actually. Yes, I've met him. I know him. Michael's great. Um, the three of us have a band um, that's coming out this year. And it's called BPM, Beats Per Music, but it's Brian, Paul, and Michael. So it's so anyway. Um, so that's a really fun project because it's it's a group project. It's um, um, did, did a lot of writing on it and uh, just all kind. And I'm using a lot of different bases, doing you know really utilizing the piccolo bass, the four string bass, the five string bass, um, the nylon string, doing doing all kinds of unique things with the bass in a very contemporary format. The thing that's cool about this record is that it's and 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 I'm not saying this as a put down. I'm saying this as it's very radio friendly, meaning the songs are really strong. They're really melodic. They have great hooks and great grooves, but it's got a little more calories than your typical contemporary smooth record. It actually has got really great musicianship. Um, and the, some of the songs are are really, they're really great. So it's fun because what we're trying to do is, is in, in, if you look at the band like Foreplay, you know, um, what we're trying to do is is take, you know, music that is accessible to a lot to a much bigger audience, but try to make it sophisticated and bring them music that's actually really good music and really exceptional musicianship in a way that they can still relate to and grab so it doesn't go over their head. Right. So it's so just it's a three of you. Yeah, well, it's the three of us, and then and then we have different special guests. The band will be five, you know, keyboards, bass, you know, keyboards, drums, me, okay. Paul, and Michael. But um, but it's the three of us are the main artists. Um, so that's really fun because it's it kind of takes me out of my element a little bit, and I've done a lot of co-writing, um, which has been a blast. And and it's also really fun for me because I get to use the bass kind of like I do in a lot of my records where I get to use the bass in many different ways. So that's really fun because one of the things on my records that I've, I've loved, which is, you know, the, the, you know, it, it's, it's the biggest blessing and the biggest curse of my life is being blessed with diversity, um, which has really hurt me in a lot of ways professionally, but it's also incredibly rewarding is I love utilizing the bass in many different ways and playing many different styles. So um, it's just really fun to take the bass and to push its role in the music. It's still a bass. All my stuff that sounds like guitar is still a bass. Yeah. I use my fingers. It's still, if it's all the, if it's the shredding rock and roll distortion stuff, it's 34 inch scale, four strings with fingers. You know, it's like, it. it's still a bass. I still think like a bass player. It just doesn't sound like a bass. I play it differently, but I'm still a bass player. So I love taking the bass playing concept physically and changing its role musically. I love that challenge. So um, projects like this are really rewarding for me because I get to push the bass and push the envelope. So, so I'm doing that. And then the LaFaro thing is, is, you know, it's just great to make another jazz record again, like a real actual jazz record. And that just came out. The reviews knock on wood have been every review. Thank you, Lord has been incredibly positive. And it's doing really well on radio. So I'm, I'm, that makes me very pleased because, you know, I think the project deserves it. It's because it's coming from such the right place. So it'll be interesting to see the success of this and how well it does. And if it continues to do well and, and make some noise, um, I'm very happy to make, you know, real jazz records for the rest of my life. So for me, it's, it's, it's always been kind of like having two different careers, the jazz, straight ahead jazz career, and then the contemporary side. You know, I'm writing a lot of music for another contemporary record. I'm sure I'll start one this year. Um, so it's just it's it's about that balance between the two. As far as me 
personally, as a bass player, I would love to play with a lot of different great people and just have that experience of playing music with people. You know, I, I'm still a bass player. You know, I still enjoy playing bass. I still enjoy being a sideman. I still enjoy the role of the instrument. And, you know, it would be really nice to uh, to play with some great people. It's just, I think it's, it's, it's just wonderful to, you know, it's just wonderful to play music and make music with people. Nothing, nothing is ever going to, you know, change that. Just like I said about technology, nothing will ever replace playing music with people for people. Nothing will replace that. So for me, I just want to do as much as that as I can, Beautiful. especially now, right? I mean, you know, we're getting old, right? It's the way it is. Unfortunately, it's like, I want to take advantage of it while we can still do it while we, you know, you know, while, you know, we're still in the game. I know that's not, you know, I don't mean it that way, but it's like, it's still, it's a lot of work. I mean, traveling is, it's hard, you know, you're traveling all over the world. It's exhausting. It's, it's a lot of work, you know? So you, you know, I, but you get on that stage and you're playing music for people, man, what's better? I I interviewed Mike Stern once for my guitar site, and he says, we we play for free. We don't get paid to play. We get paid to travel. Right. It's very true. Ernie oh, Watts told me that 30 years ago. It's very true. He's like, I don't, he goes, I play music for free. I get paid to travel. And he's right. Right. It's like, if you think about it, you, 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 you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, I don't care if somebody's paying me a hundred bucks or a hundred thousand dollars, I'm still going to play the same way. It's like, you only know how to play one way. What are you going to do? Play worse because you're being paid less. I mean, some <laughs> guys might do that. I can't. You play the way you play. It's either good or it's not. I mean, that's it, you know? So Stern's, I mean, I, you know, I, just, I love, man, well, I used to hang with him and Jago. Trust me, it was crazy. But finally, I finally, like after all this time, I mean, Mike and I have talked about playing together for years. And I finally got a chance to do a gig with him. It's like, come on, man, we got to do this. And it was so much fun. It was, it, it was like, it was Mike Stern, it was um, Randy Brecker, Dave Weckl, and Jeff Lorber. It's like, you know, that was the band. It was like, it was stupid fun. It was so, it was so much fun to play with Mike, but it, you know, just, just, just to watch him and look at that smile and his hair and just his vibe is just like, oh man, it's like, that's, that's, that's it, you know? Um, but he's right. You play because you love it. And were you playing, excuse me, were you playing electric or upright? I play electric. And um, we play, uh, you play because you love it and that's it. You know, and it, it just God, that was so so much fun. But that's why you play, right? You get you get paid for the 23 hours of the day that you're not on stage. Yeah. That you're at home or dealing with, you know, excess baggage and layovers and crap. That that's that's what you get paid for, right? You know? Yeah. Brian, I feel like I could talk to you all day. I mean, there's uh, so much so many tangents that we can go off on. I really enjoy these conversations. I don't think I I think this is your fourth interview on for bass players only i don't think i asked you this question it's become kind of my signature sign-off question and you you really made it very clear that you love to play bass and that's what you do and it's what you love and all the reasons but my question is what would you be if you were not a bass player something outside of music well, outside of music, I mean, well, I, I'd, I'd be, I, if it's in music, I'd, I'd just go back to playing drums, which I love to do. That would, I would be, I would, I would be a drummer. If I practiced for a few months, I could do any gig on drums that I could do on bass. So I could certainly be a working drummer and would love it because I wouldn't have to worry about the chord changes. It would be great. Yeah, right. Um, it's like, what key is this in? You know, who cares? Um, I really, honestly, I'm, I'm very passionately into drag racing. So for me, um, I would, you know, if I could, the problem is with drag racing is like, how do you want to make a million dollars in drag racing? Start with $5 million. Um, it's <laughs> like, you can't, you know, you, you have to be extremely wealthy to, to do it and have the right connections or the right sponsorship. I mean, it's, it's, we're talking multiple, multiple millions of dollars a year to do it right. But uh, in a perfect world, I would love to, um, I would love to do that. I, I, I have a lot of passion for the sport and for the, um, I know this sounds kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten you know, Lee Sklar's into hot rods and we, we've gone to the races together and stuff. So it's like, there are some, you know, Pete Chrisley, great tenor player. Um, he races, his son drives. I mean, he's like the real deal. This, you know, drag racing is like, you know, you'd be surprised who's into it. But there's an interesting correlation, maybe on the spiritual side between, you know, between drag racing in a sense and playing music is in that instant where everything, you're putting everything 
everything is on the line in those few seconds. Everything. You're, you're, it's like it's about from getting here to there as quickly and as safely as possible, right? And that intensity and the sound and the vibe is no different from the energy of playing the best solo of your life. It's exactly the same thing. You're doing the best you can to play at the top of your ability. In that moment, you're giving 100% of who you are. In a sense, that's what racing is. You have to give 100% of who you are to win. So it's they are completely diametrically opposed, but there is a similarity in the passion and the desire to succeed. Nobody ever died from playing a wrong note, though, or playing out of tune. Oh, I'm sure a few have been shot. <laughs> no, but sadly, I know of a couple of musicians that died because they cheated on the wives, and the wives came into the club and shot them on stage. Lee Morgan, by the way. Lee Morgan, yeah, yes. So yes, yeah, so you can you can still you know, and I and Elvin Jones one night at the Vanguard got really pissed at one of his sax players in the middle of his solo. He stood up with his stick and hit him in the head right in the middle of his solo. So you can get hurt if you play bad, right? Well, I mean, we can get into stories about Mingus, too. But, uh, well, you know, was, that well, old school, that's like, you know, it's like that, that's, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's, yeah. That has I nothing mean, to do with the music. Uh, you know, it was a long time ago, but I interviewed Marcus Miller and, and I asked him the question I asked you, and I think he said he'd be a race car driver. Mm. So uh, just yeah. uh, look at Michael Jordan owns a NASCAR team, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's, I, I know this, you know, some people may feel that I'm stretching, but there's not that much of a stretch. The energy of competition is the same as trying to do the best you can when you're playing. It's this comes to me, it comes from the same place. It is pure honesty in that moment. And I guess that's what it is. In that moment where you're trying to play the solo of your life, where you're trying to win, beat the guy next to you or get the curve, whatever it is, whatever racing you're into, in that moment, it's the same energy. You are still performing at the best of your ability. And that to me, is that's the correlation it's the it's coming from that same place so, i like how you tie it together because i never know where these conversations are going to go i've interviewed over 850 bass players now and some of the answers i was talking to billy sheehan and and we got off talking about jackie gleason yeah <laughs> that's just strange things, incredibly but. talented guy i don't think people realize a i don't think people realize how great a pool player he was but also, how talented he was. Back oh, I thought you were talking about Billy Sheehan. You're talking about Jackie. No, Gleason. Jackie Gleason. It's like, no, it's like Jackie. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's like they don't make them like they used to. Look look at Sammy Davis Jr. The guy could play 10 different instruments and sing and dance, and he was a great drummer. It's like, you know, it's like they just don't make them like they used to. Yeah. People did everything back in those days, and they did it all really well, you know. Now we're lucky, if, you know, lucky if I can get through autumn leaves, you know. It's <laughs> like, it's crazy. <laughs> I think we better put a lid on it here and and uh, look forward to the next one because there's obviously always so much we can talk to. And I mean what I said a minute ago. I could talk to you all day because uh, there's a, it's a lot of interesting stuff that uh, that that could come up and a lot of interesting people. Pete Chrisley, God, I haven't heard his name in ages. Such so such a great player, man. Such a so, I mean, you know, he was in the Tonight Show band. I mean, that yeah. you know, back in L.A. in the day. When you think of the average level of musicianship of the guys in the studio scene back in the day oh, yeah. was remarkable. They could read anything. I mean, anything. They can play anything in any key. I mean, I've been on sessions with some of these guys where I felt like I was a Cub Scout and, 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 and you, know, I, you know, I could do what I do well. And I, it's like, I'm this, they're like this. I mean, there, there are so many sessions. I've been on major movie dates. You know, Randy Waldman, incredible piano player, like, you know, Barbara Streisand's music director, like burning jazz player, but complete virtuoso. I'll be on dates and, and they'll write something for the bass. And we're talking, there's like 80 people, 100 people in the room. It's like full orchestra, big band. And, and, and they hire me and they know I can play sometimes okay. So they'll like, sometimes they'll write, some like crazy stuff because ah, you're Brian Brown, you can just play this. And I look at this, it's like, wait a second, let me look at my calculator out, you know? So I'm like trying to figure out what the hell. And I'll go to Randy, hey man, can you play this? Or let me just check it out. He goes, oh yeah. He just sight read it, play it perfectly. I'll hear it go, all right, thanks man. And then I can cut it, you know, it's like, it's like, but the musicianship level of these guys, I mean, the sight reading, I mean, I've been on cues where they will, the first time you read something down, they will sight read 
I mean, the first time we would play something down could have been recorded. It was that good. And we're talking some challenging stuff. They can, these musicians are so good. And sadly that, that day, you know, those days at that level, it's still there with the string players and some of the A team, but the A team is a fraction of the size it used to be back when it was all live. But that musicianship. Yeah. Let's that's too why bad. One more story. And then, then we got to, we got to yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff Berlin. Oh, yeah. man about uh, playing with Frank Zappa and Zappa gave him the chart ahead of time. And he, you know, with Frank Zappa chart. So it was ridiculous sure. and he's shredding it. He's practicing. He puts all this time into it, gets to the studio. Zappa says, okay, let's play. And they start playing and he says, stop. And he says to Jeff, what are you doing? What are you playing? He says, I'm playing the chart. You gave me the chart. He says, Zappa says, let me see that. Oh man, this isn't the bass chart. I gave you the guitar chart. Sorry, here. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. And what you have to try to understand and figure out is was it actually an accident? Well, put uh, on purpose, right? Wow. Well, let's let's close on that note and leave the people. Yeah. Room. Brian. Jeff Berlin is a great reader and a great player and could play that stuff, right? And Zappa was a freak of nature, you know. Um well, yeah, we can talk about um, there's uh, Tommy Tommy Tedesco and a Frank Zappa gig, sight reading like guitar player sight reading some Zappa stuff, right? Wow. Just just to just to show Zappa, yeah, right. And apparently, this is a story I heard, and I heard it from more than one person, so it's probably true. Now he was a very large man with a big stomach and a mustache, and he came to the audition in a tutu, a pink ballerina tutu. Tommy Tedesco, are you talking about? Yes. Or and Zappa put this chart up that's like, you know, 5,000 notes and 20 different time signature changes and all this kind of stuff. And apparently he sight read it down, like read it, upper left corner to bottom right corner, just played it. That's how good these readers, that's how good these players were back in the day. And and it was like, I think from that point, it was just like they were buds, you know, but it was like, you know, I'm going to, you know, like, I'll show you, you think, you know, that that kind of vibe, but he literally just came in dressed like a ballerina with his mustache and 300 pounds. And he comes in and sight reads probably something that I would, would have to stop at bar two. He sight read the entire chart. Sight awesome. That is incredible. Especially, right. especially if it's true. The new album is called La Faro. Get it? It's incredible. And I have been listening to it nonstop. And it's 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 not just great music, but it sounds good. The production and the musicianship, everything's great. Brian, congratulations. And we look forward to all those other things that you mentioned. And who knows what else is uh, percolating up in the, the brain there. Thank you so much. Much luck and continued success to you. Always, my bud. We're 40 years now we're going on 50 years so uh, thank you man thanks for your time and congratulations on all your success as well thank you man. uh thank you you're watching for bassplayersonly.com i'm john leapman founder and first baseman if you've ever wanted to learn bass you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the four bass players only community a lot of them over 50 and they are learning music having the time of their life playing music that they love learning bass you should join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. You're never too old to groove. So let's play bass. Thanks again to my special friend and my, my special guest and my dear friend, Brian Bromberg. I will see you next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, let's play bass.